I'm Kristen Ward, and welcome to Maquette Vallant's Summer of Stories, Episode 4. If you enjoy the show, please like, subscribe, or share below. You can also help sponsor the project by visiting paypal.me forward slash kward story dance. Special thanks this week goes out to Photography Stuffs on Instagram for the beautiful moon photo that was used in the front plate and as a backdrop for the story in this episode. If you like their work, you can follow them on Instagram. There's also a link in their profile where you can buy prints from their Redbubble store. Tonight's story in honor of this weekend's full moon is The Moon, as written by the Brothers Grimm, and it's actually one of the less grim of the Grimm tales. A long time ago, when the earth was new, the nights were dark. There were no cities, no airplanes, no cars, nor even street lights to help people find their way. And no moon nor stars in the sky. At the creation of the world, the light at night had been sufficient. But now the darkness lay over the land like a thick blanket. People had to stop their work, their visits, and their travels as the sun set each day. And the long winter nights seemed relentless, with each croak or groan of the roof striking fear of what icy fingers might be just outside. One summer day, four brothers ventured out from their homeland. And as the sun began to sink behind the mountains, they sought refuge against a tall oak tree. When the light grew dim, however, the darkness was kept at bay. And when the brothers looked up, they spotted a bright, shining globe high in the tree's branches. Though not as brilliant as the sun, the globe shone a soft, lovely light far and wide, and instead of being fearful, the brothers chatted and sang long into the night. The next morning, as the sun returned and the brothers began to travel once more, a countryman passed by on his horse, and the brothers asked him about the lovely light that had kept them company through the night. That is the moon, he answered. Why, our mayor bought it for some gold coins and fastened it to that oak tree. He has to pour oil into it daily and keep it clean. But in return, he lives very well. The brothers continued to gaze into the tree as the countryman rode on. The first brother was crafty. We have an oak tree, at least this big, in our homeland. We could hang this moon there. Think how nice it would be not to have to knock about in the dark. And surely a country as rich as this could buy another. The second brother was quick. And as soon as the idea passed his elder brother's lips, he hurried back down the road towards their home and came back with a cart and a rope. The third brother was a good climber, and up the tree he scaled with the rope. He drilled a little hole in the moon to pass the rope through, then tied it off and let it down to the youngest brother in the cart. Now the youngest brother was both strong and clever, and once he settled the moon into the cart, he covered it with his blanket, lest the light give away their theft. They arrived back in their home country as the darkest part of night set in, and hung the moon in the tallest oak tree they could find. The new lamp shone its silvery light all over the roads and the fields, and into bedrooms and sitting rooms. Young and old rejoiced. By the light of the moon, elders told stories, musicians played, 
and young lovers walked hand in hand. The winter nights were still long and cold, but the silvery light on the fresh fallen snow brought new stories of sleigh bells and magic. Knowing by experience that a thing as precious as the moon might easily be stolen, the brothers took turns guarding it and caring for it. And in return, the townspeople provided them with food, clothing, and coin. They lived long and happy lives, but no human lives forever. And gradually, they grew old, and one of them died. On his deathbed, he requested that one quarter of the moon, as his share, be buried with him. And so, on the day of the funeral, the mayor climbed up the tree with a pair of hedge shears, trimmed off a quarter of the moon, and laid it into the coffin. The light decreased, but not too much. When the second brother died, again a quarter was buried with him, too, and again the light diminished. It grew weaker still after the third brother's share was brought with him, leaving only a quarter sliver, which was then taken down and buried with the youngest brother went to his grave. The darkness of night once more returned, and when the people tried to go out without their lanterns, they would knock their heads together and trip and curse. Meanwhile, down in the underworld, the four quarters of the moon reunited and shone a light the likes of which had never before been seen below. The dead began to wake. They rubbed their eyes and crawled from their graves and stretched out their limbs. When their eyes adjusted, they began to dance and beat on drums. Some rushed to the public houses where they drank and shouted and fought and caused such a ruckus that the spirits in the heavens woke and began to stomp on the floor to quiet them, causing thunder and earthquakes on the earth between. The people of the earth huddled frightened in the dark and called for mercy. And finally, St. Peter took pity on them. He called for his horse and led the heavenly troops down into the world below, where they made the dead lie back in their graves. Once all was quiet, he took the moon with him and hung it high in the sky, where it would be safe from mischief, and for all of the people of the earth to enjoy. With the full moon coming up, this weekend of July 4th, 2020 is a great time to enjoy the night sky. And so your challenge this week is to simply spend some time outside. What can you see? Take a photo and post on Facebook or Instagram with hashtag MV Story Dance. I would love to see your photos. You can also tell us about your experience in the comments section below. While I was researching this story, I was amazed to find stories about the moon from all over the world. Our ancestors of all backgrounds used stories to explain the things that they saw in the world. Nowadays, we have science, which not only offers us concrete explanations, but even more beautiful and colorful stories to tell. In order to elaborate, I called on Mike Hennessy, manager of Buell Planetarium at the Carnegie Science Center in Pittsburgh. Hi, Mike. Hi, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you do and how we can find you? Sure, yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for inviting me today. Uh, my name is Mike and I manage the Buell Planetarium over at uh, Carnegie Science Center on Pittsburgh's North Shore. Um, so you can find me um, Pretty much most days presenting star shows uh, in the planetarium or talking about the moon. That's wonderful. And the Carnegie Science Center is open now, right? For um, with so, uh, some restrictions. Yes. So we are we are back and open to the public. Um, we're encouraging folks to buy their tickets in advance. 
Um, and we do have uh, reduced capacities and folks are wearing masks uh, just to uh, just to keep themselves and everyone else safe. But we are open again and, and sharing, uh, I think, just all the joy of science throughout the Science Center and in particular, the wonders of the night sky in Buell Planetarium uh, for our visitors this summer. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, so a long time ago, our ancestors, really of all different cultures, told stories to explain how the world came to be and why it, we see it in phases in the sky. Uh, what stories about the moon can science tell us today? Yeah, that's, I think that's a great question. And through science, uh, the, the story of the moon's evolution has really unfolded for us. Um, and I'll maybe hop over to a picture of the moon. Oh, that's great. Yeah, so when we look at the moon in the night sky, here's an example of the full moon, uh, which is actually coming up um, on July 5th. Uh, when you're looking at the moon, it's telling you a story. It's, it's like a very old antique book, but where none of the pages have yellowed, where there's no tattering or damage, uh, the story is still pristine. Um, because there's no wind or water to erode the story of the moon. So what we're looking at is the evidence of ancient volcanoes, ancient space rocks that have hit the moon um, millions or even billions of years ago. Uh, and the moon can tell us the story of how it evolved. Um, for instance, if you look at Tycho Crater, which I'm pointing to right here, it's at the sort of southern end of the moon. And you can see that with your naked eye uh, when the moon is full. Uh, well, that's the story of a space rock that slammed into the moon about a hundred million years ago. Oh, wow. Shot out all that. Yeah, right? Um, and that's a pretty young crater for the moon. <laughs> um, shot material in all directions, and it kind of looks like spokes on a wheel just shooting out everywhere. Um, and really, since the 1960s, the satellites we've sent to the moon have helped us to tell that story better. Um, so as we look at the moon here, you can see the light areas, we call those the highlands. Uh, the darker areas, uh, we call them maria. That's Latin for seas. Um, people used to look up a few centuries ago and thought they might have been oceans on the moon. Um, really, those are just uh, lower areas that filled in with volcanic rock from ancient lava flows on the moon. Um, and we learned a lot about that. That that story came to be through through satellites that we've been sending to the moon over time. Um, I can actually share kind of the story of the moon in fast forward. Oh, neat. Yeah. So in in the '60s, NASA sent a lunar, um, actually a, a whole fleet of lunar orbiters to the moon that that helped to map the moon and tell us the story of how it evolved over time. And we can look at that now and fast forward. What we're looking at is, is a story based on data that satellites collected, looking at the geology of the moon. Uh, we know that at one time it was molten, that it cooled, and that it was hit by lots of rocks, like that one. <laughs> um, so the early pages, the first few chapters of the moon story, uh, were, were pretty violent in the early solar system. Uh, it was bombarded by these space rocks, these cosmic collisions. Uh, and we can read that story just by looking at the moon today, uh, because without erosion, uh, all of those craters remain on the surface of the moon, and they're still there to tell that story. And at the same time as the moon was being hit by space rocks, volcanoes uh, were erupting all over the surface of the moon, and wherever that lava flowed, here we can see lava flows, and wherever that cooled down, that's where those dark patches formed, what we call the maria or the seas. Uh, that's why um, many cultures see the man in the moon today. It's because of or those dark rabbit, patches. Yeah. yeah, or the rabbit, yeah. Um, and I love how those same blotches on the moon can be interpreted different ways. Uh, but it all really happened because of those volcanic lava flows in its ancient past. That's so neat that we know so much now. Yeah. So as we were connecting for this interview, you mentioned the upcoming anniversary of Apollo 11 and some Pittsburghers that helped out with that moon landing. Yeah, uh, so July 20th is going to be the 51st anniversary of the moon landing. Um, we do a show called Fly Me to the Moon at the Planetarium and in researching it, 
I was astonished at how much Pittsburgh played a role in it. Uh, we were far more than a footnote. Pittsburgh was just just hugely a part of the entire process, from manufacturers building the Saturn V uh, to Pittsburghers who helped to map the moon. Um, I actually have a couple photos of some Pittsburghers, if you'd like to see, that were that part of that crazy. effort. <laughs> sure. Um, so this gentleman here is Alex Valentine. Uh, he worked for NASA Mapping Science Laboratory, and he's a Carnegie Mellon University grad. Uh, and he actually picked the parking spot on the moon where Apollo 11 landed. Uh, they needed someplace safe to land, um, someplace nice and flat so that they could also blast off safely and get back to Earth. Uh, and so a Pittsburgher literally picked a parking spot on the moon. Oh, I, we are good at that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't know if he saved his spot, but yeah. <laughs> he put his chair there. <laughs> exactly, exactly, yeah. <laughs> so when we go back, NASA has the Project Artemis for sending people back to the moon in this decade. Maybe we'll find a parking chair from Pittsburgh. I don't know. We'll yeah. see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so another Pittsburgh pioneer is Dr. Elaine Arrington. Uh, she's a professor of mathematics. Um, and the first African-American woman to graduate with an engineering degree from Pitt, and she grew up in Homestead, uh, and she calculated uh, Soviet crafts uh, capabilities during the space race. So she was another kind of MVP for NASA uh, that helped us get to the moon. Um, and NASA's chief of technical services even, his name was Jack Kinsler, and he designed the flag and the plaque that are on the moon today. Oh, that wow. Were left by the astronauts, yeah. Uh, so, so everywhere throughout, I think, getting us to the moon, there was a, a huge imprint of, of Pittsburgh hearts and minds working on it. I love that. So our challenge this week is to just go out and enjoy the night sky. Uh, I know we have a full moon this weekend, but what else can folks see? Oh, this is going to be a great weekend. Yeah, we do have a full moon. Um, and I actually put together a couple images of what the night sky uh, will look like if you'd like to see them. Sure, that'd be great. Yeah, uh, we can take a look at, at what will be up. Um, so here's the full moon on Monday, July 5th. And near it, I'm pointing to two sort of bright dots in the sky. That's Saturn and that's Jupiter. So they're both going to appear to look very close to the moon from our perspective on Earth, uh, which will be very exciting. It looks like you can um, even spot them with the naked eye. Yes. Yeah. So you don't even need a telescope. That's a great point. You can see the moon and Jupiter and Saturn will be glowing very bright, very sort of yellowish white. Um, and they'll be very close. If you stick out your arm um, and hold your pinky up at arm's length, they'll be within just two or three pinky fingers of the moon. So. Oh, neat. <laughs> um, and I think there's some more going on in the night sky as well, too. The moon will be pretty cool. Um, there are also some really neat constellations that we'll be able to see all summer. Um, and they'll be high in the sky this weekend. Um, so if you'd like, I can pull up an image of some of those uh, constellations. Sure. I know um, constellations and storytelling to go together very well, too, because our ancestors made up all kinds of uh, stories about the the shapes that they saw up there in the stars. Yeah, and I think these are amazing stories, and I think they're they're such a gateway for people today to get inspired about exploring space, learning about science, just looking up at the night sky. That I, I know for me, working in the planetarium, that it all it all starts with the story, and that's what is captivating for me, and I think captivating for a lot of folks is. How did we see these different shapes in the sky? Why, why did people see different shapes and, and give them different meanings? Um, and there are three constellations that are really prominent this, this summer. We'll take a look now. Um, so I've got two birds here and a harp. <laughs> and um, if anyone's maybe an hour outside of the city, they might even see sort of a milky band in the sky that's the milky way looking oh, back to the that. center of the milky way yeah so it's so folks will see two birds basically flying down the milky way um this is a swan named cygnus this is aquila the eagle 
and this is Lyra the Harp. And the constellations um, are Greco-Roman in origin. That's where their stories come from. But the stars uh, that make up the constellations, uh, their stories have Arabic origins. And to find these constellations, you'd want to find these three stars. This one is Altair. And I'll move my cursor up to Vega. This is the fifth brightest in the night sky, so not too hard to find. Uh, and this one over here is Deneb. And even if it's tough to see a lot of stars in the sky, you can actually look up and just draw a triangle with your mind between these three stars. Oh, it's I the summer that. triangle. Yeah. Um, Altair in Arabic is the flying eagle. Um, probably my favorite story around Altair uh, is the story of Mike Collins, the, the navigator uh, who took us to the moon with Apollo 11. Uh, he actually went to a planetarium uh, night after night to study the stars so that when he was en route to the moon in Apollo 11, he literally looked out the window with a telescope and he'd, he'd confirm what they were looking at anytime they just shift the direction of the ship. Uh, so he went to a planetarium to learn about the stars and, and use that knowledge in, in real life in outer space, which is awesome. Um, but Altair is the flying eagle. Vega in Arabic, its name is the eagle that's landing. Which oh, I think is has landed. Right? right? That's like <laughs> how perfect an alignment between those stories. <laughs> um, and then uh, Deneb means tail for the tail of the swan. So, uh, and you can see these high overhead really uh, this weekend and throughout the summer. Um, Altair, Vega, and Deneb. And they make up that, that summer triangle. And it's a fun triangle to hunt for. Um, and just thinking about the fact that those same stars that inspired ancient people to look up um, literally were also the stars that helped us navigate to get to the moon too. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's really neat. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. This has been fun just to share kind of the, the story of science and talk about the moon. I really appreciate it. It was fun chatting with you today. Likewise. And thank you for watching. Again, if you like the show, please like, share, or subscribe below. You can also donate at paypal.me forward slash kwardstorydance. I'll see you next week for episode five. In the meantime, check out missed episodes right here.